Volume 4 C-34. Guard the others, Quad War won't be going anywhere, Yaldabaoth laughed, the sewing of the two members of the opposing species was quite complete. Their legs were joined together, sewn tight first with thread and then by magic. The Quagoa was missing his right arm, the dwarf was missing his left, and they were joined at the shoulder the same way the remnants of their upper thighs were. Whatever their names had been before, Yaldabaoth now referred to them as a single being, Quad War. The two could share one another's pain, as proven when each one howled when the opposite side of the body was seared by a drop of molten lead dropped on each one's cheek in turn. The pain was great, so great that they each passed out for some time, coming to just in time to hear Yaldabaoth's instructions and listen to the babbling hay dwarf chatter on and on and on. The two heads of the single being turned to look at one another, singular hatred for the other was set aside in favor of their singular fear of what more Yaldabaoth might do to them. More importantly, the things they heard him say. Perhaps it tells us how he can be stopped? The same question echoed in their minds, most of the other prisoners and experimental subjects were moved, but those sown beings were left largely unwatched, and in Quad War's case, not even bound as it seemed their tormentors assumed that the two which had become one could not have hoped to escape no matter how they dreamed of it. Dwarf. Can you move, or are you broken? The Quago asked. Move or die. I'd rather move. My leg works. Yours, Quagoa? The dwarf whispered the response. I'm Quagoa, I do not give up so easily, Stumpy. The mealy-mouthed and toothless Quagoa growled. Good. Furball. Good. We will be alone for hours, but where do we go? The dwarf in half asked. My people, they're closer. The Quagoa whispered. And get myself killed? No thank you. The dwarf whispered in spite of the pain that stabbed all over the side of his face. Can we reach yours, thick-headed Stumpy? The Quagoa growled through his slowly moving jaw. The dwarf was quiet for a moment, fine. Yealdabouth is worse to both of us than either of us are to the other. We go to yours. But I want you to promise me my life when we get there. Would you believe any promise I made, dwarf? The Quagoa hissed the whisper out a few inches from the dwarven face, each bore the same brand like burn on their faces, and each one's eyes burned just as hot with both hatred and fear alike. Just start moving before I change my mind. We might not survive, but I won't give that bastard a complete victory. The dwarf grumbled, and they inched their way off the table, pushing an arm and leg in unison until their one good leg each hit the mountain floor. I go first. You follow. The Quagoa said as they brought their shared body up to a seated position. The stone was cold from sweat and chilled blood, and some dripped down to darken and stain the grey rock in the dim light let in by the hole in the mountain which allowed the stars to peek in on the horror of their existence. They glanced around. Most of the other experimental subjects were either asleep or dead, but nobody was making any noise. On three, the dwarf said, and the Quagoa nodded. One, two, three. The dwarf grunted out in a hoarse whisper and the Quagoa hopped a leg forward. 1. The dwarf mumbled and hopped his leg farther beyond that of the Quagoa. 2. The Quagoa gasped and hopped past that of the dwarf. 1. 2. 1. 2. So it went as they alternated, their slow hop was shaking, unsteady, and they fell soundlessly before they'd made it a dozen paces, neither cried out in pain each thrusting their good arm out to minimize the pain and impact. Bastard! You did that on purpose! The dwarf hissed. As if I would do that during an escape. Stupid dwarf! I would happily gut your kind, but not if I had to break myself to do it. The Quagoa snarled back as they lay struggling face first on the floor. Push up together! The dwarf said without apology. Outside the mountain there was a roll of thunder and the sound of a billowing wind. The Quagoa grunted and again they counted to three and pushed themselves up to their knees. Me first. The Quagoa said and popped one leg forward, then up he pushed until the dwarf got his leg under him again. Again. Slower this time, wait until we've got the rhythm, then we can go faster. The dwarf said, and the Quagoa listened. They hopped again, putting foot by foot between themselves and the place of their torment. Passing between the shadows of buildings, the area was almost completely uninhabited now, Though occasionally they saw cages holding their respective races, they glanced at each other in mutual understanding. There is nothing we can do for them. They read the look across the lines of species, and looked with pity at their own. 
The quagga and dwarves alike bore numerous non-fatal but crippling injuries. Similarly, the two sides were chained to each other. Though most of both groups were sullen and silent, those few with any spirit left at all used it to insult their opposite numbers in the same cages. The noise of their bickering seemed to amuse the few demons Quad War took notice of, while the smell of the captives masked Quad Wars passing between narrow buildings and down various alleyways until the pair was well on their way out of the city, and headed in the direction the Quago are considered to be the most likely place to find whatever remained of his people. Far out of view, Yaldabaoth stood watching through one of his familiar's little beady bat eyes as Quad War made his, or perhaps their escape. The view was only black and white and offered little in the way of fine details, but it didn't need to be perfect, only good enough and with their wide long gait, it was sufficient. Yaldabaoth smirked, excellent. This should serve my master's plan exceptionally well. Run along, quad war, run along. Or is that more of a hop? Yaldabaoth asked himself and stroked his chin as he thought it over. He was still wondering that question when the pair hopped out of view into one of the long tunnels that populated the mountain range. Oh well, now to prod the dragons and their minions along, he laughed, gouts of flame springing from his open mouth as he did, and called forth another handful of demons to do his bidding. Volume 4 C35 Demons proved exceptionally difficult to kill. The dragons proved invaluable in that, but Peri Euro's worries were not diminished even a little bit. Have we heard any word from the small expeditions? He asked of his second in command. None, my lord. No more have made it back, and most of our scouts have not returned alive. His second replied with a dreadful shake of his head. The ones who have, all report dealing with small groups of demon probes. Minor ones. But they are hard to kill. Peri Euro wondered how long it had been since he last slept well. Before the demon appeared. But what has it been, a week? Two weeks? Who can say? More bizarre than the demons was the behavior of the dragons themselves. The concubines and children of the late dragon ruler, Olis Erdark. No snarled orders, just a desperate, fevered corporation. Seeing their patriarch die must have shaken them badly. They had fled too far, too fast, and now the way in and out of the mountain was lost to them. The demon emperor's small number of minions had few creatures to rival a dragon, but it didn't matter as long as Yaldabaoth remained in easy reach and the demons could call for his aid at need. How many casualties? Peri Euro asked while staring with a grim face down at the little lizard in the tiny cage. A hundred and twenty-seven. His second in command answered with his dark blue streaked fur shaking in the light breeze that now blew through the area. And did they stop the demon probe? Peri Euro asked, his breath quickened and then stopped as quickly as it had increased while he waited for an answer he did not truly want. Yes, my lord. We killed seven of them, the rest drew back but again they seemed disinterested in really pressing the fight. If they had? His second in command answered and his fur bristled with his shudder. I wonder if the dwarves are still alive? Peri Euro said aloud. He looked away, wistful for a moment, recalling the time of relatively easy victories, the time of certainty when he believed the mountain would fall into his people's hands one day. There's no way to know, my lord. The more distant scouts have reported the dwarven fortress on our side of the great rift is intact, so is the bridge. But we have no way to say what that means for the city, and our scouts have not been back that way in some time. The second in command looked with hungry eyes down at the caged lizard. What about food? Peri Euro asked. We got a great deal out of the farms when the dragons warned us, but not everything, and we no longer have the space or time to replace what we've lost. But still, we rationing, priority goes to the front lines for now. Sadly the demons help solve our food problem when they take captives. The second in command snapped his jaw shut when Peri Euro glared at him. Then the glare disappeared and Peri Euro lowered his eyes to the little lizard in its cage where it ran in frantic circles under their eyes. What are they taking prisoners for? What does the demon want? If it were me, then I would have sought servants, the dragons bound us to them, why wouldn't the demon emperor do the same? Are we food for them as the lizards here are for us? Peri Euro expected no answer would come his way, and none did. So Peri Euro looked down at the ramskin document again, and ignored his ration. Never-ending petitions. But none of them are requests to fight the demons on the front line. Peri Euro kept his grousing confined to the inside of his own skull. Everybody wanted to fight when there was sure victory. But defeat. 
who wants to fight a lost battle, especially one in which you at least seem to win, but still end up feeling like you've lost. I'd face desertion if there were anywhere for anyone to actually go. Pei Ryuro clenched his claws over the tanned skin full of requests from various clans. Two thousand or so did actually try to make a run for it, attempting to find some way out of the mountain by going toward one of the old dwarven gates. A few sent out to bring them home saw demons tormenting the last of those numbers, and then withdrawing from the sight of what became a bloody massacre which painted the grey rock red. It's like they want us to stay here. Do they hate us like we hate dwarves? Why? Peri Euro tried to think of any reason why demons might have a special hatred for his race, and yet none came to mind. So many questions. And no answers to go with any of them. He thought just as one of their numbers barged in. The Quagoa was one of the lighter furred members, his dark fur painted a shade of grey with a combination of ground up rock dust and mud to help hide him a little better. Simply put, he looked like he badly needed a bath. He was breathing as if he'd run for hours. He collapsed at Peri Euro's feet as soon as he came near. My lord. My lord we have. We have something to see you. The Quagua's brow-covered eyes were wide with existential horror that spoke volumes about his state of mind. Moreover, Peri Euro heard the way it was said. Something? Not someone? He blinked three times in rapid succession, then demanded, explain yourself. And tossed the list of petitions aside. A. I have no words, two heads. Quagua and Dwarf sharing a body. Th the thing. The abomination. I don't. But it comes from, ah, uh, it says it came from the fallen dwarven capital. That it was personally with the demon emperor Yaldabaoth and has words that might help us. Things it overheard. The runner shivered with mute horror, whatever he'd seen, it had been more than the young runner was prepared to cope with. I see. How did it escape? Peri Euro's eyes narrowed with suspicion. I I don't know. B but my lord. The Quago a half. It was M my brother. The scout stiffened from the tip of his nose to the tip of his toes. Peri Euro gave a low growl of pity, go, rest, send. Whatever this is, in. If what you say is true then. He almost promised to help, but set the likely futile promise aside. I am sorry, he said with sincerity, and the scout shivered again and withdrew. It took supreme effort not to vomit when the wretched creature was brought within. One half dwarven body, one half quagoa body, fused together through both common medical arts and magic, both halves had clearly nearly starved, scrapes and cuts were packed with mud and chewed leaves meant to pack injury points. They both had the start of hideous scarring around open parts of their cheeks that had been touched by molten metal. Their arms and fingers showed numerous small injuries or breaks. The dwarf, far from the robust stature normally associated with them, had a pale pallor associated with malnutrition. Worse, each one was missing an eye as well as the vast majority of the inner leg, the stumps bound inextricably forever. The stomach of the shared body growled with vigorous hunger when the quago ahead caught sight of the lizard. Peri Euro broke the silence, and did his best not to stare at the ruined version of two beings, though he also marveled that they, or it survived to reach him at all. You have information for me? He asked and taking up the box with the lizard inside, he extended it to the quago and arm. The lizard was flung into the open moor and wolfed down, but while that was happening, it was the dwarf side which answered. I. Ah do, we do. And here's all we know. Peri Euro listened with horror as he found the answer to the most pressing of questions, and learned the answer was worse than he ever imagined. I need help. He realized, and asked himself the all-important follow-up question. How do I get it? Volume 4 C36. Overnight, the runesmiths became the most important people in the dwarf kingdom. Gondo's heart sang as he stood beside his only master. I came up with this idea, your majesty, he said and waved his hand out to the smiths in the room who stood over the heatstone benches etching in tandem. Instead of one small bench each, a large one was packed with heatstones which had a thin sheet of oracalcum over it. Before, it wasn't possible to really try this out but thanks to yourself. He looked up at the magic caster king with a smile on his face and tears in his eyes. It can be done. What can be done? Ains asked himself and almost covered with a lie, but then he paused. I've seen CEOs ask questions before. If I'm not expected to know, it's okay to ask. Could you explain it further? Ains asked, I have no experience as a runesmith, he chuckled a little as if it was funny to imagine he would, 
and Gondo laughed with him. Forgive me, your highness. The long bench allows many to work in tandem instead of one alone, and that, he pointed to a little pyramid device with a long swinging metal rod jutting up from the bottom which swung back and forth in a constant steady rhythm, is my newest invention. Eins watched it tick back and forth, there was a constant steady ticking noise from the base which seemed like it would go on forever. Other than that though, it seemed to do nothing, like a clock which ticked without any numbers to tell the time by. I call it a metronome. It counts time, see, your majesty? He asked, a beaming smile on his face while Eins looked over the runesmiths, each of them had their little chisels and small hammers, each one hunched over the warm metal weapons, and each one was tapping in time to the metronome. The biggest weakness of runesmithing has always been its inefficiency, we dwarves hate inefficiency, living under the mountain like we do, we have to be economical in everything. Gondo explained, and the runesmiths grunted in wordless agreement. This doesn't completely solve the problem, but between your majesty's marvelous rings of sustenance and with this new process, we can cut production time down considerably. For purposes of efficiency of course we're all doing the same runes, things demons are weak too and we're limiting it to two runes per weapon, and the same for armor. For armor it will be slashing and piercing resistance, it won't be perfect, but it will minimize the damage we take. For good measure, Gondo went over to a corner of the room where a pile of finished sets of rune-enhanced plate mail sat. He reached out and picked up one breastplate and held it up in both hands. When we have more time I want to focus on covalently bonded runes. What are those? Eins asked his confidence going up as he asked the question, the runesmiths wore little smiles on their faces as they worked, hearing a king ask about their craft seemed to please them. They don't exist yet. But I've always believed that they could. The idea is to bind runes together like a sentence, thus enabling us to use more runes per item. See, majesty, runes look to me a lot less like symbols and more like words, like they're part of a language, and if I can just figure out how to tie them together? Who knows, we could make that 18 rune blade again, maybe, Gondo said with a mix of happiness in his voice and determination in his steady unblinking eyes. They are, Eins confirmed, in another world, where runes originated, they were the language of a people which lived far away from me. Coming to this world, it was shocking to find it used this way. Gondo stiffened. Your Majesty. I, are you telling me I'm right? The dwarf, it seemed was capable of a very high pitch to his voice at least some of the time. He dropped the armor when it slipped over sweaty fingers and fell with a clang and a clatter to the floor. The other runesmiths actually briefly stopped their steady rhythm. Gondo was right? The hushed whisper was one of utter disbelief and awe. I'll leave you to your work, I said, I need to speak with Hegenmil. He then made a hasty retreat, but the damage was done, or the bonus was applied, depending on how it was thought of. When word spread among the dwarven city weeks earlier of their submission to the kingdom of Nazarick, the one who brought their own alive through the gates and away from the Quagua, their reactions were mixed. But the king who tamed a dragon was increasingly welcomed by the dwarves, and as he mingled among them up to the present, Eins came to like them. They are like salarymen at one of the few companies to look after their workers. He thought in passing. They were boisterous drinkers, passionate arguers, and he found it easy to mingle among them so much that they soon began to refer to him with reverence when his name was uttered. So now, when the revelation that Gondo was right spread out among the dwarven population, and it was confirmed by the ancient king himself, the relatives of the runesmiths were treated with great reverence. The workshop where the runesmiths labored with their tiny precision tools became a popular place for the young to visit. I want to be a runesmith was now uttered commonly among the youngest of young dwarves. Word of the demon spread too, and this flung the dwarves even harder toward the kingdom of Nazarick, with all kinds of questions constantly being turned his way. What kind of army he had, how many soldiers would he bring, and of course, can we really win? Eins answered the same way, with cryptic nonsense which sounded wise. Do not ask can you win ask how can you win then do that. Oohs and ahs at his practical wisdom made him ever more popular, as did his frequent gifts of beer from his home country such that many a dwarf drunkenly asked, are you just a very tall dwarf from a kingdom of dwarves? It was hard not to laugh, and so he didn't resist, allowing himself to laugh with them he answered, good alcohol, like a good friend, is highly prized in my country, and we have many thousands of years of experience with both. And so, 
Day by day as they prepared for the struggle ahead, the dwarves opened their hearts to their new king. Similarly, his flights with Hegenmol became a regular part of the routine. The dragon was slowly starting to look more fit. He ate less, though his reading habit was unbroken. There was some muscle definition beginning. Another ride, your majesty? Hegenmol asked when Ines came into view. Yes, they seem to like seeing me do that, for some reason. Ines shrugged. Isn't it obvious, your majesty? Hegenmol asked as Ines swung himself up over the dragon's back when Hegenmol crouched down to allow it. No, Ines answered. It's simple, I'm not as much a dragon as say, my father, his bitter words hung for a moment before going on, but I am still a dragon. I'm considered untamable, and one of the fiercest creatures. Even if you know I am not. They don't see it that way. So seeing you ride me out beyond the city beneath the stone sky, it fills them with optimism and a sense of security. This is what a king should provide, Ayn said, and thought about that more in relation to Hegenmal. That is what a father should provide. One who doesn't, is no father. No sooner than he said it, he thought of Demiurge out there, and as they soared to the sound of cheers fading behind them, coming ever closer to the Great Rift, Ainz felt the urge to see the Guardian again. Volume 4 C37 Demiurge stood up and stretched. He temporarily released his hold on the evil Lord of Wrath, and allowed the demon to go about the business of harvesting resources. Using him to mine was a brilliant idea, even for me. I'm sure Lord Ainz will be pleased. Oripped from the mountain was steadily transported to Nazarick, thus providing ample material for public works. Further, the mines were walking height, creating a kind of path that would take them north, thus opening a path to both the city-states and the northern part of the Baharuth Empire if a secret path of invasion was needed for some reason. Caution, my lord has always prided himself on his caution and preparation, if I show the same trait. Demiurge didn't finish the thought, instead he leaned his back against the empty wall of the vault he turned into his de facto headquarters. Everything seemed off and yet, everything had never seemed so right either. It was like under the two sides of a knife's edge, and Demiurge had to walk the fine center of the blade. Was it one mistake that caused Lord Albert to look at me the way he did? Why couldn't I even say goodbye? When he made me, he praised me. When he left, he said nothing. That was the worst part. There was no point in his life before where Demiurge could say, Here, I failed. No point at which he could say, Had I only done this a little better, I would have at least been told goodbye. With no point of failure, no shortcoming he could find, he could only curse his pride for failing to see the weakness in himself that his father must have seen. And yet one stayed. He muttered and lay back stretched out on the floor, one foot crossed over the other at the ankles, and his arms crossed beneath his head, he stared up at the blank white ceiling. His look was as blank as the stone, and for a time his busy mind was blessed in its emptiness. The one who stayed was different different in strange ways that even Demiurge himself in his vast wisdom couldn't quite fathom. He is always unfathomable. But he even feels different. What is it that has changed? He is more affectionate toward us. More. Or just different. It was enough for him to roll onto his side as if ready to sleep, the wall he now looked at was no different from the ceiling. He turned his mind away from ugly thoughts that felt far too treasonous or inappropriate. Instead he focused on the matter at hand. By now Quad War will have reached the chief and have learned a great deal, he'll be desperate for allies, and shortly, if they haven't already, the refugees from my first meeting with the Quagoa will reach home. The dragons will be desperate for help, and if they go, the Quagoa will follow. He reached into his dimensional storage and plucked the item Armageddon Evil out of the little whirling black void. He looked at the little item, it wasn't the final version, having only three arms around the seated goat man. But it was Lord Albert's work, a precious treasure of his creator, and now it was his. Demiurge could not weep tears through crystal eyes, but he could feel the abyss of sorrow as he looked up at it, and if one were to ask him, he might have said that his crystalline eyes shone brighter in such moments. The little object was more than a holy relic, accepting it from Lord Ines. It's as if he wanted me to have it, a last gift from a father going somewhere from which he cannot come back. Is that the truth? Is that how Lord Ines was able to bring us here? Were they? Were our parents dying for us? The sudden thought shot through him like a bolt of lightning and he shot up to a seated position. No. No 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 no. 
Demiurge's chest began to heave as he wondered if it could possibly be as he imagined. He didn't say goodbye because he didn't want to go. Or didn't want me to know the truth. His chest heaved as he stared down at the little item. Is that what Lord Ines was trying to say? What even he couldn't say? Demiurge shouted the question in his mind and slapped a hand hard on his forehead. The supreme beings were sacrificing themselves. One by one. To keep us, their creations alive and to prepare us to come here. He sounded out the long sentence with great slowness, and then again. And again. And again. Lord Ines. He knew. That's what he meant. Isn't it? Demiurge asked the empty room while his chest heaved and unshedable tears built up in spirit if not in liquid form. He recalled the words of Lord Ines, the unfathomable being always had layers upon layers to his every utterance. You couldn't go where he was going that was more or less what Lord Ines had said. At the time. At the time I thought it meant he went somewhere we simply couldn't exist. Demiurge muttered as his fingers tightened around the impossible to break little object. But in hindsight. That makes no sense. If the supreme beings wanted us to be able to go there. We would be able to. They're gods. Of course we could have been modified for the journey. Demiurge muttered on, his words picking up speed as his mind raced on and on and on. His breathing pace picked up along with his thoughts. But there's one thing that would be true for. Death. We can't survive death. Even undeath. We wouldn't be ourselves anymore. Oh by all the supreme beings. By Lord Albert and Lord Punitomo and Lord Belriva and Lady Booker Bakushagama. Without missing a beat, Demiurge recited the name of every single supreme being of the great tomb of Nazarick. I'm right. That was how my lord made the trip. The supreme sacrifice. Demiurge's mumbling became broken. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. The words etched on the arena wall and in the throne room took on new meaning. They're not gone because they loathed us. Or because we failed them. They're gone. Because they loved us. Certainty crystallized like his eyes, and all he could do was kneel, clutch the relic of his father to his chest, and think of the quiet moment he vanished forever. His black heart broke in his breast, and all he longed for was the presence of the one who stayed. And yet, despite all that he was, all that he knew, all his impossible belief in the impossible wisdom and power of the king over Nazarick. Demiurge was still surprised when he felt that familiar hand on his shoulder, and heard the voice of his master asking, Demiurge. My boy, are you alright?